Okay. Hello. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? In now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So welcome everybody to our today's webinar. My name is uh, Dorota, I'm, uh, I work for Medartis, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Meffert from Würzburg, Germany, Pro uh, Professor Eugene Egg from Melbourne, from Australia, and Dr. David Tuckman from Manhasset, from USA. And today our guest speakers will be sharing with us their expert opinion on complex clavicle fractures, and they're going to take us through new treatment options for instable lateral and mid shaft fractures. And just before we start, a short introduction to the webinar platform, Zoom. And I would be very grateful if you could keep your microphones muted and please make sure that your camera is off so you don't stream any video. It's for the best quality. And then if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box. You can see like a little speech balloon at the bottom of your screen in the menu bar and our experts will be reviewing the questions uh, during the session. So please feel free to ask, any question, ask a question anytime. And just to let you know, during the webinar, we will have a few poll questions and the answers are of course anon anon anonymous. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Meffert. Rata, thank you very much for your introduction. I say hello to everybody. Um, usually I would say um, good morning, but good morning is for Eugene, who is here with us uh, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and here in Würzburg, I'm a trauma surgeon from the trauma center at the University of Würzburg. We have now eight o'clock, so um, it's a late night show. <clears throat> we um, started a few years ago with a very international team to think about a new implant system for clavicle fractures. And I would like to show you a little bit about that development. But first of us, let's check how we're gonna communicate through this system, through Zoom. So um, we have some TED questions for you. Now, the first is very easy. It's just to train the system. Um, we get chat by, um, by Durata and um, we can vote. So let's try that. So who is the audience? And uh, you can just find the possibilities. Specialist in shoulder or general orthopedic trauma. Maybe you're in training. We call them assistance arts in Germany. Maybe you're uh, in training as a physiotherapist or maybe you're a re representative in the medical field. So let's see who we are. It's less, let's wait just a little bit because we're still getting, uh, we're still receiving answers. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we have a group of shoulder specialists. Most of them are um, board certified trauma surgeons. Some of them are still in training and we have quite a large number of representatives, maybe from an artist, could be, huh? All right, good. Now to train the next communication system we have here, we use the chat function. So we want, would like to know where you're from. So let's go into the chat. On my screen, it's on the upper end. I go into chat and just give a four because as a German, I'm from Europe. All right, quite some Europeans, but I've seen Australia. And I have not seen all of you. If I'm counting right, we are more than 50 people at the moment. And we should use that system to communicate a little bit easier. I'm not sure whether David Tuckman from the US has been uh, introduced, but he is the one who moderates it. And he is looking into the chat function. 
David, I hope uh, you support me a little bit because I hope we get some questions. If some good ideas come up or if some criticism comes up, so you could catch it and we um, try to kind of discuss it because I think a webinar should not be, you know, just a PowerPoint presentation. We should be a little bit more interactive. All yes, right. yeah, you, um, Rainer, I'll be looking at the questions and I'll, I will jump in. Perfect. Okay. So let's start with what we have done. The question comes up, do we need surgery for clavicle fractures at all? And what are our indications? Now here you can see grossly displaced. So you can feel it below skin. It's nearly perforating. Some of these fractures have more fragments, so they might telescope. Some of these are very lateral. So the complex of the coracoclavicular clavicular um, complex is gone. And you might also face some patients maybe with osteoporosis where you have failure of plates. So maybe you use different implants. Also the intramedullary nails have some advantages. And if you see these very lateral fractures, we could ask who of you is still using hooks below their chromion to maintain position or who switched from this style of plates to a plate that has been a fixation or that also has a fixation through the coracoid process. Now looking first of all, what is the advantage or is there an advantage of operative treatment? And one good study I think has been published by the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, which is a multi-center randomized trial. And you can see at least in the first year, which is 52 weeks, a statistic improvement in the constant functional score as well as in the DASH result. So DASH is a lower the number, a better the function. Um, if we do plates, how do we do it? We usually use smaller incision. We try to avoid to remove periosteum, to leave everything nicely to the soft tissues. And we want to have a stable plate. For instance, like this one. This is angular stable. It's a straight one, but they're also anatomically um, banded plates. We have published a few years ago on 102 patients that has been not randomized but prospectively um, collected and we compared operative treatment by plate with um, um, intramedullary nailing with a tense nail which um, was only taken in simple fractures not in comminuted fractures and the conservative treatment. And we finally found, um, though, so this is the age group, a little bit older in average um, with a conservative treatment, but we found a significant pain reduction, a little bit similar to what the Canadian group has shown. So we have comparison of non-operative non versus plate, non-operative versus intramedullary nailing, and we had some real improvement, so less pain. That is something but it's all only one year. So a longer it goes, um, a less the different really was also in the constant score. And in Germany, our employees are quite protected. So they get unemployment um, of work and we compared that. And the non-operative group due to pain and whatever has the longest time of um, unemployment time. So finally, looking at the non-unions is, of course, a small group, but we found three non-unions in the conservative, none in the plate, and one in the um, intermedullary nailing. So at least if you say, well, what's the significant difference? Maybe nothing, but um, plate appears to be a safe method to treat shaft fractures. Now, <clears throat> what are the criteria to operate or not to operate? And one criteria I often used is shortening, overlapping. And uh, please uh, give me your criticism if you say, well, no, this doesn't help. This is a quite recent publication in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. And it took, um, it's a meta-analysis. They used four randomized controlled trials. And in three, they didn't show any shoulder outcome score advantages 
And particularly, they didn't show or it didn't demonstrate that shortening has a, a great effect um, in conservative treatment, which is not, to my knowledge, uh, what, what my experience is with that. Now there is another multi-center, it's a little older, it's 2013, published in JBJS, and it's uh, from the UK, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Bristol, multi-center randomized control. And they have shown plate fixation reduces rate of non-union and was associated with better function. However, it was more expensive, which is an issue. If you look at different plates, um, you find in the conclusion of this publication, which also is quite recent, it's 2018, that there was no difference between plate type in reoperation, in union rate, in plate removal rate. However, if you look into more detail, they look at plastic deformation of plate, at plate breakage, at screw pullout, and there is a reconstruction plate. We, we don't use that in more than 10 years because we know there is a high rate of complications. So they have shown that, but obviously in these criteria, they couldn't find a difference. To me, it means uh, we are not in the end point of development. So there are still plates where we have a certain rate of, um, of problems. So having said that now, all these results cited with all the knowledge you have on your own, who now thinks plate for clavicle shaft fractures are useful. You think, yes, absolutely. My young sportive patients have a high expectation and get that. We can open um, the TED question now. Or do you think there is no indication for surgery because you have good experience with conservative treatment? Or do you think there are criteria, the demand of patient, the morphology of fracture, that really uh, is the main issue? Or are you a believer that only lateral fractures with disrupture of the coracoid clavicular complex is a good indication? So please give us your vote. So I count 62. Um, people in the audience, and uh, we have to check who of you has already been voted. So we, we have half of the answers there, but there's a kind of tendency. So I guess we can just close the poll. Oh, uh, wait a moment. Wait a oh, moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why do we have half of the people not voting? With less than 98%, we're not closing. No, no, uh, <laughs> we should probably close. How many do you have now, 40? Almost 50%. 50%, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, let's open 51. it. 51. <laughs> um, okay. So we have half of the people saying that plates are useful. I have taken the example of the young fit with high expectations. Uh, but the big number, 40% has also said, said it is depending on demand and morphology. So I think the most of these patients have conservative treatment, am I right? Is there somebody in the audience who has voted that and want to give us some criteria? what he thinks, we can use a jet function, but you can also open your microphone and just talk in. There are not so many people at the moment. Is there somebody who wants to give us morphology, morphology criteria? If not, the chat function is open. You can use it later on if you collect your arguments. So we're gonna carry on and uh, um, do we need new implants was the question. And what about the MedArtist system? So some um, issues I have written down here. So we have a safe polyaxial anchoring of screws in plate, polyaxial. There is a large variety of implants for optimal fit. So I was asked, what is the best plate? Which plate do you like most? And I said, the plate that fits best. 
to the fracture. So it can be any plate. Um, I hate bending. I mean, I use synthes, I use other implants, and these are so stiff and strong, it really is a hard time to bend them. So I would be happy not to bend them. Sometimes I have a hard time, if I have multifragment, to get a good reposition. I use the plate to help me for the reposition. So if there is some smart add-on, I would be happy. Um, and I would like to have a stable system, particularly for the lateral fractures where I have some small fragments. I don't expect too much of grip of the screws. Okay, and uh, maybe there should be an alternative to hook plates. Let's see what we have. Now, those of you who don't know how the locking mechanism and trilock um, of the Medartis system has, it's a friction locking solution. So the screw is, um, is screwed in and once you lock it, whatever position you have 30 degrees of freedom. So 15 degrees in all direction and you can see that. I don't know, can you see my little arrow here? Um, you can see the thread um, that takes the screw and gets that friction fixation. Now, let me show you some pictures from the design surge surgeon team. Now, um, the one in the red box are with us today, or shall I say this morning to Eugene or this night to David. We have Daniel Branham and David from um, the US. We have Eugene from Melbourne, Australia. We have two very experienced colleagues from Switzerland and also from UK, Great Britain. So that was Ben Oliver from Nottingham and Mike Walton from Brightington Trauma Center. So different people, different philosophies came together and we had some funny, nice discussion. One discussion was, question? We are always open for questions. Um, the question was, what type of plates do we need? Well, of course, we all know shaft plates and we know lateral plates. And it was actually David, uh, Daniel Branham in our team who says, no way, we need a third type of fracture. Because many of these fractures are on the lateral third and if you want to have the plate in the middle of this um, fracture area, it never fits well. So we need an extra plate. So the um, superior plate, which is a lateral shaft plate, was pushed hard by Daniel. Now, anterior mid shaft, anterior lateral plates. It was really David, and I would like to, to give this a little bit to you, David, to... Um, to tell us your philosophy because he said if we really want to have plates fitting to all different types of fractures there is a need for anterior placement of um, the plates why do you think that you know i i think you know i think there's a there's a, a divide uh between you know at least between europe and the us in terms of cl clavicle fracture fixation uh going superior or going anterior um, going, you know, interplating is obviously much more common in, in the U S and there, there, there's some advantages and advantages and disadvantages. So the, I think some of the, some of the advantages are that, you know, the, the plate kind of really does sit very well, very well anteriorly. The, your instance or your, your, um, you know, your, your need for, for removing that plate is really much less because it's going to be much, I can imagine. much less yeah. prominent. Um, you know, as well as, you know, you get much, much longer screws, you know, going superior screws are, you know, 12, you're happy if you get a 14. Uh, going anterior, shortest screw is typically an 18 and your lateral screws can be 22, 24. So you do tend to kind of feel better about it. Uh, anterior plating is stronger in cantilever bending. Um, you know, you do definitely have to strip some more soft tissues off anteriorly, but you know, that as opposed to superior, superiorly, but I clinically have not really seen much of a, much of a problem uh, with that. So 
I think it really comes down to kind of what you're used to philosophy, stuff like that. Um, you know, there is, um, you know, if you look at the anatomy in terms of really the things we're worried about, right. We're worried. The big thing worried about in, 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 in fixing clavicles is hit, is hitting something we don't want to hit specifically subclavian vein artery, stuff like that. So if, from a trajectory. And that is not so likely in the anterior position you say. So it is. So yeah. So if you look, so medial third is different from the middle third. So medial third, the subclavian vein is literally just posterior to the clavicle. So I would not go anterior all all the way medial. Middle third, your trajectory is nowhere near where your vessels are. So from a trajectory standpoint, it is safer. Um, Though the the bottom line is that if you are concerned about it, you don't have to put a bicortical locking screw. You can do unicortical locking screw abutting up the opposite cortex with a perfectly equivalent strength. So if you're concerned about it, you do have the option of going superior and just not doing a bicortical screw. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I think the debate, the <laughs> I think the debate will rage, so we well, shall see. But that was see. always a reason for me not to do it because um, you have to release quite a bit of the insertion of the delta, of the fascia. Yeah. And uh, maybe I asked Eugene, what's your experience with anterior plating? You do that once in a while for what argument or would you say it's very unusual just for revision cases or whatever? Yeah, I, I really don't have much experience with the anterior plate. The only time I use an anterior plate is in the, when I do double plating. So it's okay, superior, an anterior for those that are highly comminuted fractures that I'm bridging and they need to get back to say motocross or you know our Australian football. So for the rotational stability, that's when I go anterior. But I totally agree. There's a lot of anterior stripping that you need to do, um, but. I totally agree that the, you do really feel good when you put these 18 millimeter, 20 millimeter screws in. I feel like, uh, you've got a really strong Maybe construct. Question to both of you. Um, if you use the anterior plate for comminuted fractures, do you open it up or do you do it with two small incisions like a pull through plate, which has been described as one of the technique? I think if you have a comminution, it's a point to think about. Is it a way you do that or you do the open reduction and try to get it as anatomically as possible? I personally do open and I try to strip as little as possible. Sometimes that is That's possible, do, sometimes yeah. it's not. I, I have seen that technique and it is a, it is a very interesting technique. Uh, and it is something I haven't think about playing with in, in the lab, but uh, I personally just go open and, and I just try and really strip it as really as little as possible. <laughs> I have said than done just sometimes. removed a, ver a very long plate. It has been done in some Asian, I don't know where, where this person was in holiday. And they had uh, three cuts because they couldn't get it. So they had one cut to put it in, one cut to put it out, and one in the middle. So I said, oh, <laughs> you, know, a, you, you look one, like with Adidas. A one centi with a one centimeter skin bridge between yes. the old <laughs> incisions. Not so good. Yeah. Okay. Um, if the audience doesn't have questions to us, I have a question to the audience. We are 69 people now, and I would like to know who uses anterior plates for clavicle fractures. Is it A, oh, the bottom is in front of it. Um, is it your favorite position? David, that's your point, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to give a dollar fifty to anyone who says anterior. <laughs> I know that, so. Okay. We prefer euros. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no indication for anterior placement. Is there no indication? Or do you use it once in a while? And this is what I will do. <clears throat> and we need some more time. I think people have to get used to the voting system. And OK, we're 70 now. So we need at least 50 answers. And uh, Dorota, you will have a look. Um, how many answers do we have? Uh, yes, yes, we are almost 50%. So, <laughs> Rainer, they're, they're actually, you know, what's while we're waiting for the voting, we do actually have a question. Uh, oh, okay. And the, the question is uh, when there's a comminuted fracture, do you use K wires to, st to stabilize it or do you use the, su the suture technique? 
Um, to be honest, if the fragments are big enough, I use my very small screws, 1.5, sometimes two millimeters, to fix them, to screw them, because I have particularly in uh, the shaft area, no good experience to use K-wires for temporary fixation. So I have these, uh, how do you call this? Not hemostat, we have the uh, but, reposition uh, bone, clumps. Yeah, a, 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 a bone fracture. reduction clamp. Yes, but the, with a sharp tip. Yes. And I have them, because I'm also hand surgeon, I have them for the fingers, very small. So I sometimes use that. But indeed, not always uh, you succeed. So you have to make up your mind to leave fragments connected to soft tissue. Um, sometimes I cannot succeed to get the reposition done. So I use the plate to help me to get the reposition. I hope that is... If yeah. you have another answer, give give us a tip. Give us a not a tip, a, a, a trick or whatever you you can use. All right. So what's the answer? Who is in favorite? Thirteen, David. You're not alone. Well, it'd be you know what? It'd be interesting to see what you know what happens with that number moving forward. So uh, I think we should do this every year for the next twenty years and let's, <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> All right. So there is no indication for anterior. Some of them are very confident with the superior replacement. I have used C. There are some revision cases where I feel more comfortable with the anterior plate. And I show you, I've only done three cases with a new plate system in patients. And one of them I have used, and I can show you why I did it, even if it's not my standard, why I thought it's a good idea. All right. Let's have a look at the at the ver variety of, of systems. Of course, the superior shaft plate has different lengths. Sometimes you need something really long, but what is new is in this red box. So we have different curvation, different radii. So some are anatomically more straight, some are strictly curved. And uh, we thought we don't like, you know, um, um, bending plates, so we need more variety. And this is left and right side, so this is no big difference. And this is for the mid-third. And this is also for the mid-third. So um, I don't know, David, if you want to add some information to that shape, but if you look into the curvation of the lateral, of the shaft, of the medial, you can find that, and this has been done by a lot of work, 80 Caucasian bones, Caucasian bones, sorry. Um, and this is how this curvation really um, has been developed. And now we come to the most, uh, um, how can we say that, exciting plate, I think. Um, you might um, look for a hook on this side, but we have said there is no need for a hook on this side. We're gonna do it differently. We have a option for um, superior screws, angular stable. And we have also the option to catch the lateral piece of bone by sagittal screws. And this one I will show you later on in the film. So, or even here in the picture, we have a little hole and whatever you would prefer to do using whatever fiber wires to fix um, the lateral clavicle onto the uh, coracoid process, or if you need a screw because your fracture side is somewhere else, you can use that hole um, um, as you need it. Now, here are two examples, and uh, oops, um, sorry. Um, we have two different fractures. This is from uh, uh, a specimen we have operated last week on and you see it's kind of ugly we wanted to have a shaft fracture but we got a little bit more and we wanted to have a lateral fracture and now let's hope that the film um, is running can you see the film running yeah we, okay we good so it's not cut to the final version, but um, once we opened this up, um, we found many, many of these fragments. And here is the medial aspect. This is the lateral aspect. Hmm. Superior blade. 
David, you would prefer superior? anterior. No, I'm anterior. just kidding. <laughs> of course, because uh, definitely superior. Now, next time you go to Basel and do this, but this time I was the one who had to do it. So I can show you why I would like to have a, a hand tray in these fractures uh, yeah. close. So I, I use some small 1.5 or two millimeter, depends on the size of fracture fragment. And uh, finally I use, Let's see whether that works. So this is the variety of, this is the marking of the fracture area. I always use the red position as I have here in the specimen, have a free arm um, to do this. And now it's not so easy really. And look at these, ah, it's a little bit hard to see. We have, uh, in addition to help us to get reposition done, <coughs> we have a uh, small olive wires. So they have a thread. They're just a centimeter of thread. So they don't really cross over to the other side. And if you move hard, they're not so strong. But if you use two on each of these long fragments, we have a quite stable um, fracture reposition. You might think this is a bad reposition gapping, but I show you later there are many small fragments fitting in there. So um, this is the option and now we have the sliding hole. This is not an angular stable screw here. So it allows still motion. This is a fragment belonging in here. Can you see that? So it was a little bit ugly fracture. Um, let's see whether we need all. Um, and here we have that fixation finally here is the sagittal screws and here is that bone piece that looks great looks really good well it's a long liver arm therefore i think uh, it should be okay um and we had this other plate which is the lateral plate and this is more exciting because we have more options and we have to think a little bit more um so this was the other specimen we have looked at. This is a medial shaft, here is the neck. Here's the lateral fragment. You see it's a more um, tangential fracture, as you can see. And it was, I, I think it was an 85 year old, so quite osteoporotic. If you now check on what plates are available, here is the middle. So if we take the, sh the shaft plate, where sits the shaft plate? It sits in an area not adequate. No, we don't need. Let's see whether um, the lateral shaft plate is good. So we have more options where the shaft goes into the lateral side. And again, this is not a liver arm that is adequate. It might fit. So this is the plate we think is the best for this area. And uh, here you see it's a small version, but I used a long version. First of all, I wanted to see whether it fits anatomy well. And secondly, I thought in this type of, of bone, I need a long liver arm to prevent a tear out. Now, once I've prepped and seen all the fragments, um, we better make sure that the coracoid, which is here, is prepped first before we fix this. I usually use a Dijon, but we didn't have it in the anatomy. So I used, a, you say hemostat for that? We say um, overhauled. Um, and then this is the hard bit a little bit. You go underneath, make sure you have the tip of the nose on bone because you don't want to grab anything medial to that. And uh, Finally, you have to put a bit more side and then you can see that. Here is the hemostat and you grab it with something. I used a little clamp. <clears throat> so that is the hard bit. And you release it. And once you have that, um, it's quite stable. I mean, in severe osteoporosis, which is not so frequent, of course, we have the young sportive guys you must be a little bit careful. Now you have these little grooves, these little dimples here, and which I think is very nice. You can affix 
um, the plate on bone without slippage all the time. And here again, here's the olive thread wire and see how the plate sits down to bone. It's not very stable, but stable enough. This K wire is in the AC joint. So you can see how far you go to the lateral side. Here we um, fix the aiming block. You can use it, but you don't have to use it. And uh, you always should um, put the screws first here because here you have more um, variety, and which is really nice. I haven't, I didn't know that, that we can go through the block, use also that K wire uh, with the olive on it, and we have some temporary fixation where we feel this could work. That, so that sat down, that sat down incredibly well with that, yeah, with that olive oil. Careful. I mean, you cannot play around like crazy because then it's getting loose. And uh, I have used a very long plate, so it always stabilizes the shaft here. Um, and I wanted to have a bit more stability so I don't have the rotation, the propeller effect on that. Um, and use the screw. I always try to use the angular stable screw in the most medial or the most lateral side because then you have an elongation of your liver arm and that's mechanically of an advantage. But we wouldn't expect a, expect a problem on the medial side. We expect a problem if there is one on the lateral side. So I step ahead. We're going to fix screws and I hope I get the right. We haven't cut that. It's, you know, not really to the finish. And now we have these little sleeves. Here you can see the most medial. How long is it? I don't see that, but it's usually something between, as you said, 14, 16. So we, we are gonna use this as an angular stable screw. Now we have already put the screws, except one into the block. And uh, let's remove the block now. It is removed. Here you can see, ah, okay, hold on a second. Now I've cut away. Um, you see when you drill here, you have to go between these lines. What you can see here is now, this little device goes, comes with the tray. It's a 19 uh, wire, very nice with a little um, sleeve on it. And then you can pull it through. Um, through that little 2.35, it's the same drill size, really small, as you need for the screws, and then you can get the stability. And now, since you don't need a screw here, you have that as a little clip off, and uh, finally you make your knot, um, close it, let's put away my fingers here, Okay, now it sits. And uh, what I want to show you, here's a fiber tape also. So you can decide this goes through the holes, very nice. If there is any addition, and I had that in one case where I did not rely on the coracoid, I, I've wrapped it around this fiber tape around uh, the plate and the bone. So this is also one option we have. Are there any, can you see that? I switched to my presentation. Uh, we're still seeing the video. Still seeing the video, so let's see. Is that better? Yep, yeah, that's it. Okay, so this was a result. I have put the superior plate, which needs to be quite long, just two sagittal little screws. But uh, I must confess, um, David's positioning on anterior screws uh, plating would be maybe even of favor in this case. So both is possible. I've just put the plate on because I wanted to see how well it is for the shape of the anatomy. And in this case, it was fine. The other case was very osteoporotic. You see the two sagittal, not ideal because it's a somehow oblique um, picture. You see the superior screws, the anterior screws, and what you don't see, which I've painted in here, is the fiber wire that holds it down through the coracoid process. Now to some cases uh, I have had in my surgery. Uh, wait, actually, you know what, uh, Rainer, before, uh, before we go to cases, there are actually a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm happy to take them. 
all you can take them. No, it, no, it's all you. So, when you use a when you use a one five screw, are you using them as lag screws? Are you over drilling? Are you compressing first with a clamp and then drilling? Yes. That's the easiest because if you want to do it correct, you over drill the the nearer cortex and you rely on the far cortex. But that, to my experience, sometimes a bad idea. So I use a tip clamp, maybe two of them, to get compression temporarily and adjust put in the screw as a, not as a compression screw. So it gives me a, a good grip on the, on the nearer and the far cortex. Yeah, same here, same here. So we have, uh, we have another question as well. So when you're using the lateral plate, as you showed in the presentation, uh, are you filling all, all of those holes? Uh, shouldn't we be concerned about fixation stiffness? I'm much more concerned about um, uh, tear out of screws than of stiffness. Um, it's hard to answer because we all know uh, osteosynthesis plate might be too stiff. So um, I, I don't think it is really a problem in this case. If you want to have primary bone healing, like in a plate osteosynthesis, I wouldn't expect, unless you gap it, you know, you keep it apart, then it, you have a problem. Then you need some motion because you need some um, periosteum, uh, no, some callus formation. But here, I don't know if you see my pointer. Um, this, there is no cortex usually. So if you have the grip from your four or five screws from the superior position and add in a 90 degree angle the, the sagittal, um, screws. I think you get some stability preventing um, the tear out of the cancellous screws here. I have, I don't think we experience a problem on the medial side. I'm not sure whether I've answered correctly that. So no, I, I, I think, think too much good. stiffness I mean, is a smaller problem than tear out of the implant. Yeah, I, 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 I think, uh, I think the, I, I think obviously the concern is would be a concern of non-union, but we don't really see a lot of non-unions with uh, fixation. So, and I agree, where I was doing much more concern about the plate pulling out than uh, than uh, than the fracture not healing. Eugene, do you think uh, too much stiffness in primary bone healing? in the shaft of the clavicle is an issue we should more address? Yeah, I, I, mean, I agree with what David said. You rarely see non-unions, unless it's more in the comminuted um, high energy trauma setting. Uh, I mean, in, in Australia, we have a lot of contact athletes with our Australian football that <laughs> want to get back within four to six weeks. So we sort of have no, uh, we have no choice but to make a very rigid construct uh, to allow- So you're the back. fan of double plating? Well, we, sometimes we have to do that because some of our patients just won't listen. And if there's comminution in the mid shaft, there's so much bending that we worry about implant failure. And I think the good thing about the Medardus, the new Medardus mid shaft plates, is that there's a broad um, section in the middle. If you look at the other plates, there's even holes throughout. And I've seen plates bend at that middle hole. And I think yeah. when we designed our mid shaft plate, we specifically made a, that made a section in the middle that's um, without a hole that's stronger. So I think in that setting where we're bridging, there, there's a lot more strength in the mid shaft to prevent that too excessive bend, but at least enough to get some callus uh, or some um, relative uh, fix, you know, stability. Yeah, I agree. Much, much better answer than I have given. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, the screw placement too small to the fracture, too close to the fracture, I think is a problem of stiffness. And mm. as you said, I, I didn't think about it really. Um, usually we have a, you know, a not so close to the fracture, our um, first screw. So it allows a little bit of motion, not too much of stiffness. Mm. Probably this young gentleman, it's a sportsman. He wanted to go back to sports as early as possible. I mean, if you look at that, the overlapping, probably you also could accept. I don't ask you the question, um, would you prefer to do conservative? We have discussed that. I mean, it's written down in the consent that there is a possibility to treat this non-operatively. So I think you have to really tell the people that it's possible. Now, this was my first case. I thought, okay, that is not a too difficult case. I should manage that. 
and get some, um, some experience with that. So this is a blade I've used, the shortest shaft blade for mid shaft. I have checked on the dimples. I have checked on, the, on that stuff I haven't used before. And then I tried to um, fix it and it went quite well. I didn't slip away with the forceps too much so I could easily maintain the reposition, get my length, put the screws in as it's shown here. And finally we had that. This one looks a little bit shortish, but um, in the second plane, it was actually in the cortex. So I thought having these in the 15 degrees to elongate the liver arm, that's my philosophy to do that. So I don't need so long plates. Um, I found it okay. And if we see the post-op x-rays, you see here there is this somehow a little bit thinner that bone so it was a bicortical my second case was a little bit more ugly are you have questions i'm more of a comment hey yeah, it looks great okay yeah, it looks really good nice so Ryan, i think maybe it's worth mentioning on this x-ray how there is that middle section of that uh, uh, solid bridge as opposed to a lot of the other plates on the market have e even holes throughout the plate uh, that have an area of weakness in the middle hole. That with this system, that's right. Being, yeah. So if that's you show right. them, yeah, that section there, at least you have that rigid midsection, which is important for these transverse fractures. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, you explain this area. I use Correct. the smallest plate. The smallest has three on each side. This is the old school that we know. We use six cortices. We all don't know whether. In angular stable, four is enough, but I, I go on the safe side. So, and this distance is a little bit more than usual. You have in plates. The plates I used, you know, use a seven hole, three and three, and in the middle there's a hole nobody needs. So um, this is exactly what you said. There is a stronger part of the plate that prevents breakage. Okay, if there is no question, we come to my second case before you want to present your cases. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, Rainer. You know, actually, there is one quick question. Uh, why not 10 osteosynthesis? Why not? Uh, 10 TEN osteosynthesis. Oh, could be, could be possible. Yes, is an option. Because um, actually, these are typical ones um, where you don't have additional fractures. You don't expect telescoping. Um, I don't like the 10 nail if I have extra fragments, if I have oblique fractures. I have observed so many of those sticking out again because uh, there is shortening. But in this case, yes, I agree. I probably would have achieved the same um, stability or nearly the same. And do you do you remove the plates? And if you have to remove the plate, what's your time frame in terms of waiting uh, for the fracture heal and all the uh, you know subplate osteoporosis to go away? When you removing these plates? Um, to be honest, I tell or I ask the patients why do they want to have it removed. So let's say maybe half of them come and say um, let's remove the plate. And I say, why? Because that's a surgery and that's a risk. And do you really need that? And now we come to the problem of plates in general, um, particularly in slim people, it's very prominent. And now you come with your anterior plates and I show you, I've done in one case, exactly for that reason, an anterior plate. Um, <clears throat> um, now time frame, I love to push them the long run, at least one year. I feel more comfortable with one and a half years. And once I re take off the plate, I ask them not to do contact sports for six weeks. That is quite short. Probably three months would be the better, but they don't. And I think in Australia, they don't do at all. So Eugene, how do you decide on um, when do you remove plates? Do you remove them at all? For what reasons? And uh, stress shielding, after removement. Yeah, so in, in my practice, a lot of the footballers, they either rugby or Australian rules, I, I tell them to take it out at the end of the next season, at the off season. 
So I let them play with the plate in for the whole season. But there is a high incidence of plate breakage around the plate and the periprosthetic fracture is a disaster. But I at least leave it in for one season and take it out at the beginning of the off season to allow them to recover. But I usually say six weeks um, to protect it, no contact. Um, so yeah. after plate removement, you mean six weeks uh, yeah. where the stress shielding is a higher rate of refracture? Correct, yeah. Okay. I, have but I think there's a study that shows after three weeks, the bones are sufficiently filled in to be as strong as at six weeks. Okay. So I, I still wait six It's weeks. hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm always a little bit cautious and say, well, do less and don't risk. Mm -hmm. This lady here has six weeks down the road from, uh, of course, not from us, from other hospitals. St. Elspeth's Hospital has put this plate, as we usually say. And we had, um, it's, it's indeed not our um, osteosynthesis. I have no TET question, but if somebody wants to come up and use the chat function and give us his idea or telling us something about the problem here. I mean, this lady is a little bit older. She has osteoporosis, as we all can see. We're looking for cortical bone and don't find any, um, but it's torn out. She's in pain. She takes a lot of painkillers, so something needs to be done. Okay, I just carry on. Or somebody wants to give me an idea? I, I just have a question. I mean, was there, any, was there any concern for infection? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Clinically, no. Um, laboratory findings, nothing. But uh, if I see something like that, um, six weeks later, there was no accident again or something. Um, yes, I told this lady, maybe we take out the plate, maybe we debride bone, we put in local antibiotics and we see us again in a week from today to get replating. And if we do that, it is bad luck for you because you're an elderly lady and I need bone graft. And it's not really nice to have bone graft from an elderly lady because, you know, even iliac yeah. crest is not very efficient. But I guess I was lucky. I mean, this operation is now, I don't know, three weeks ago and she's going fine. So I opened up, I didn't have really signs of infection, but that doesn't mean too much to me. If I don't see the pus coming out, it can be still a low grade infection by some sort of staphylococcus um, epidermidis. And ugly, isn't it? This is um, the lateral part of the clavicle and this is the medial part of the clavicle. And um, I tried to use all fixation technique, but the, since she was so osteoporotic, I was afraid. Okay, somebody has a microphone on, I guess. Could you check all on your microphones? <laughs> Lucene, I, uh, if you can just, I think that, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so I was a little bit worried if I take the coracoid as an anchoring system, I might even break the coracoid process. So my solution finally was to use all the screws available, to use the anterior screw placement, what I rarely do, but in this case, I thought it's, uh, it's judgeable to do it. I used the fiber tape and I've wrapped it around the pieces of bone, wrapped it over the plate, so I don't have um, the connections of the coracoid. I don't know whether it was the right decision, but um, I felt if that breaks, I really I am in trouble. So finally, these are the intraoperatively pictures. The aiming block was on. I used the screws from the tip first and the um, sagittal um, screws last. The sagittal screws are quite long, something around 20, 22. So that gives us a little bit of good grip. And I have used the long plate. So I have a long liver arm hoping not to experience a tear out of this fracture. And this is how it looked post-operatively. Did you use any bone graft substitute? No, I haven't, I haven't used yeah. it because I don't believe in that. No, I, I don't think, think you need it. Actually, <clears throat> if you need compression forces, like in a tibial head fracture, like in a pylon, yeah. maybe in a, then I, I don't mind. Uh, then I think it's a good idea, but biologically spoken, 
it might even prevent healing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That looks fantastic, Raina. Yeah, it looks amazing. Well, up to now. We remember yeah. it was six weeks down the road when the yeah. first blade breaks. So let's wait three months and then we talk again. Well, hopefully then they go to someone else. <laughs> I, send it, I send it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can buy, buy him a ticket to Melbourne. <laughs> uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's an expensive. <laughs> All right. Okay, how much time do we have left? Five minutes. Oh, my God. Um, shall we have a, Who wants to bring up his case? I'm sorry. I, I was too long talking about that stuff. No, you're you, kidding. That was great. Uh, I have one case. Do a case to show? Um, this one, let me just give me one minute. Why yeah, no, go. Go ahead. go ahead. Because <clears throat> yeah, we could, shall we ask the audience, do we have some extra minutes or do we have to quit in five minutes? Because it would be interesting to hear your opinion on a very slim Italian woman, very slim medullary canal, additional fracture fragments, and we all ask ourselves, why not using intramedullary nail. So the question for all of us comes, have a look, very tiny canal, very slim patient, is a good thing for plate, conservative, or nail? While we're waiting for that, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, actually, really more along the lines of the last case. Uh, someone uh, asked, uh, they know it's a long shot, but any consideration of a, of a metastasis? Ah, oh, you think the... Um, um, it was a pathologic fracture. Though, granted, we didn't see the initials, but... I'm not sure whether I even took out... Um, I did because I always, to make sure that there is no infection, I have the microbiologist as well as the histology because sometimes they tell a chronic infection or whatever from the histology. So yeah. I have taken from that area, but there was nothing really special. Not, you know, in particular, it was not a metastasis. Would be an unusual area, but nothing is impossible. Yeah, true. Okay, do we have some ideas on how to fix that? Plate. Uh, I think everyone was influenced by your talk, but uh, no, 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 by your discussion and you, uh, you to say in that. <laughs> okay, now let's quickly walk through this case. That's the lady. That's incision. That's the fracture side. I looked at that. There were two fragments, and then I used the anterior plate, and then I said, "Oh, give me the the no the the superior." And then I used the anterior. I said. In this slim lady, there is not so much muscle I must take away, but if I take the superior position, it's very prominent. So I use the anterior plate. I don't want to say my first time, but probably in the, first, in the last two years, the first time, and I liked it. Uh, nice uh, long screws, um, not perfect reposition, slightly bowing still in there, but no prominence at the top. So, David, I'm yeah, happy you know that what you I, were with us and pushed us hard that we need uh, some of those. And I, um, I, I got to tell you though, I, I think it's gonna be very interesting to see because, you know, we did specifically designed this this anterior plate, and it is different from the from the superior plate. I mean, the, the in the plating systems that I used before, the it, basically the anterior plate was the superior plate just kind of bent differently. Um, this plate is thinner; it really fits very well. It's not prominent. Um, it would be very interesting to see what happens moving forward, specifically with this plate, and. You know, specific as we see, if you look at the complication rate of fixing clavicles, a good portion of those complications is the necessity to remove the hardware. So if we kind of remove that, and I be very interested to see if we can uh, decrease our incidence or necessity of removal hardware with using this specific plate, if our overall complication rate with fixing these is, is actually going to drop. So... Uh, and that's going to be very interesting to see, but I mean, this looks, this looks great. This looks really good. Very we have nice. Not 
so much time left. Eugene, you got up at three o'clock in the morning. What about presenting your case? I, I actually didn't have a case to present. Oh, okay. No, I'm just, no, I, did, I didn't have one. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no. I, I, I have a case. I have a case, but it's basically the exact same case as this. Um, I use, I think I use an eight hole plate, but uh, I'd, be ha I'd be happy to show it if, uh, uh, you know, if you want. Um, sure. I mean, let's say it's eight o'clock, but why not staying five minutes longer? So everybody is anyway free to stay or to leave. And I hope, uh, I hope Cornelia has given us five extra minutes by booking it in into Zoom. So um, now uh, David needs to have a... Yeah, so if you, if you, if you unshare, if you unshare, then I'll share. How can I unshare? Or stop sharing, I guess. No, I think you just have to go over it, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, hold on one sec. Yes, right, we you know can what? see it. Uh, you can see. Yeah. So I'm mode. I'm not in I'm not in presenter mode, but I guess it doesn't okay. matter. So uh, this is really like my kind of real typical patient, 35 year old guy who, you know, was drunk and fell off a bar stool and broke his shoulder. So, um, you know, look, this is uh, obviously standard kind of mid shaft, a uh, little kind of mid shaft lateral fracture. Um, for me, this is a perfect plate, uh, a, per a perfect plate, a case to go, to go anterior, uh, put a single lag screw. And, um, you know, the plate just fit perfectly. Uh, it fit really just uh, really amazingly well. Patient wasn't what wasn't very thin, but uh, as soon as I closed skin, really couldn't feel that plate at all. I think the chance of this plate having to come out is going to be really very, very small. Uh, but if you would um, give us a number of how many plates you're going to remove. Is it like 10%, 50%, 80%? Much? I got to tell you from, from anterior plating, very, very uncommon. <laughs> I would say maybe five, five percent, ten or or less. It, it's really uncommon because uh, I mean we say anterior, but it's really kind of anterior inferior, um, and then and it really does kind of tuck in below, and then you usually do have a little bit of a um, of kind of a fascial sleeve that you can then kind of close over the plate as well. There's a very interesting um, paper I saw as well to kind of do a, a do a platysma flap where you um, kind of you come down to platysma, dissect down distal, and as opposed to going through platysma, you're actually elevating platysma up and then you can actually do do your fixation, and then you can then you can fix your cover it. Back, back down, which really covers up the plate. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I haven't tried yet, but I'm some, it is something that I'm very interested in. And again, you you know, kind of combine that with and with that with an anterior plate would be very interesting. Yeah, sounds can interesting. I ask you quickly, how, how do you I'm, manage the anterior deltoid insertion? Honestly, you you just you just take it down as a sleeve and you fix it as a sleeve. And sometimes you get a good fixation, sometimes you don't. I got to tell you, I have not seen um, either clinically or you know or patients you know kind of symptomatically complaining about any weakness. Um, now, if you test them on you know on a cybex or something like that, that's a different story. But I haven't had anyone complain about it. And I, I am, I definitely agree with you. And I know exactly where you're coming from about kind of, you know, you have a nice, I call it a bare area, but you know, a nice area on the superior aspect of the clavicle and you know, I put a plate there, but then uh, forget that. Let's strip everything off the front and let's put a plate there. It's um, I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but it, I mean, especially with with this plate, it, the plate is so thin uh, in terms of width. Uh, it sits so well. It's um, I, I think you know just from our you know just kind of reducing our risk for the necessity of of removing the hardware. I, I would I would try it. it it's uh, it, it's nice, and especially the especially this plate. It just it fits it fits amazingly well. It really does. But definitely, you have developed it. How could it be different? Well, yeah, I would be. Yeah, I, it would be really bad if you know this plate's really not that good. <laughs> um, when I, I, I don't really know who I didn't put on this one. 
Let me ask you, David, if you prep the anterior side, I had the impression, I don't do it so often here, but I had the impression there are two fascia, the outer and something that is like an inner, that like a deeper fascia, which you don't have to take away totally. So if you approach <laughs> really? from the anterior side, you don't have to remove the deeper fascia. So if you leave that on, yes. it probably um, maintains your, your insertion side. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And because you, you do, you know, kind of as you go kind of, you know, kind of deeper inferior, there is another fascia there that you ideally do, do want, do want to preserve. Uh, as well, actually, just, just another kind of technical point about, about putting a plate on anterior. You never have to worry about where the head is. Um, you know, when you're going superior, you have to kind of push the head out of the way and you have to make sure that you're not drilling the Absolutely. patient's head. When you go in anterior, you literally, it doesn't matter where the patient's head is. You, those screws are going from, from anterior to posterior and the head is really never, never in the way. So just a thought. I really, um, I'm happy about, I mean, both of you. I mean, you were the one who pushing the group. We said, oh no, Ontario played extra again so much. I'm really happy that you did that because you brought in your experience. We didn't have it. And now it is an option. It yeah, is, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is an option we think about and yeah. we are all kind of stuck in our training. We, we know how to we do it. We usually succeed in doing it, but changing techniques is sometimes a little bit, oh. You know. as, as one of my professors said, we are victims of our training. Yes. Yeah. Somehow. And it's true. It's true. You really do kind of get stuck in doing what you do. And which is why I got to tell you, I think, you know, you know, meeting you and, and, and meeting, meeting the other surgeons on the design team, it's great just hearing from what everyone does. Because look, you're in your own world to some degree, and you kind of make the assumption that what you're doing is the best. And some things it might be, and probably a lot, a lot of things it's not. So it is very interesting to kind of hear what everyone, what everyone else is doing. So, Great. So, um, Eugene, do you have a final comment for us to do? Otherwise, I would ask Cornelia to step in again because she is really the product manager. She has done a lot for us to organize all these international meetings. And maybe she, I hope she's still in here, Cornelia Steiger, you want I'm to here. switch want to switch on your video and your microphone and say a, a goodbye to everybody. And I hope um, you find some results of what you have expected with the webinar today. Absolutely. Even the video. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you so, so much from my side. It was great having you guys on the team. We had a very international team and exactly this discussion that we've seen right now is what made this meeting so valuable. And I think it also made our product, our final product, in my eyes, such a good product because we have a lot of opinions in there and we try to be take the best of all worlds and combine it in one system, still keeping it compact, which was a challenge. But I think um, we have a nice product that we have now out in the market and I hope everybody Let's likes see, it. Let's see, the longer we're gonna use it, a more complication like in every, every other um, implant we will see, but um, Absolutely. our team is very critical. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I think, I hope if there are problems, we will be the first who find it. <laughs> yes, I'm, okay. I'm excited to see where it is going. And I thank you all for participating in the webinar. And especially David Tuckman, Eugene for getting up, Eugene, and Rainer Method for doing all the work of putting all this together. Thank you so much for being okay. part of it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank very, you very much for your attention. Hope it was a little bit interesting. So um, late in the night or early in the morning. And uh, Eugene, you, Eugene wins a prize. <laughs> Eugene wins a prize. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Have a second cup of coffee. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Okay. So I say goodbye and uh, hope to see you all again. Stay healthy. Don't let the COVID come. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks, Abe. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.